we get back to a bit on our series that we were going through the book of Colossians, and we're going to go back to that today. And if we feel messages warrant uh, going a different direction, we'd like to take a break from it, and we'll do that, especially as it pertains to current events, as the Word of God addresses those current events. But we're going to go in, we'll be in the book of Colossians, chapter 2, chapter 2 and verse 8. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 8. We're actually going to just get to one verse today, kind of an interesting verse. Paul gives an admonition here and a warning. And he says, beware that, beware, beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy, vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, not after Christ. Excuse me, not after Christ. And we'll go in verse 9. For in Him, that is Jesus Christ, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. There's nothing lacking. There's nothing lacking in Jesus Christ today. So verse 8, Paul begins the section with a warning against false doctrine and false teachers of beware. Paul uses the term, be not ignorant, several times. Brethren, I would not have you to be ignorant. You can look it up in your Strong's, where Paul uses the term, a warning. Don't be ignorant about this. Don't be ignorant about this. And he uses it repeatedly. And even Jesus warns against false prophets and false messengers that would come and that would uh, take away people and lead them from the truth of the Word of God. But in Paul's model, here's an interesting thought. Now, because we, you all deal with people that have, uh, you have dealt with, or you will deal with, probably in the future, people that have strange doctrines, unusual doctrines. In Paul's model to the church at Colossae, heresy and false doctrine is best met, now listen to this, not with an exhaustive listing of the errors, but first with positive affirmation of the truth. Having been raised in church my whole life, I've heard the illustration for uh, you know many many years since I was a kid that if you that they would take bank tellers and if they and they would teach bank tellers and they would have a bank teller to handle all kinds of good money so that when a false or a counterfeit bill came through that they would know it and feel it right by touch because they had felt so much real money. Now we know money is is funny money; it's not lawful money. But for the sake of the illustration, it is the ferns are used to pay debts to the government. You can't pay your taxes with it. Therefore, they have, even though it's fiat currency, it has a value in that it will pay uh, taxes. And that's the only thing that keeps it afloat. If the government did not take that fiat, that paper money, for payment of taxation or bills, then it would fall flat on its face because it has no intrinsic value like gold and silver. We need to get on gold and silver. But the point is... I asked Joyce, now my daughter, who became a teller here about six months ago, is that true? Do they still do that? She said, absolutely, did. I had a test before I could be a, a bank teller. I had to feel, and they, all these bills, I'd go through them. If there's a false one, I'd feel it. Reject it. So, you emphasize the true before you see the false. And that's exactly why we've been in, in Colossians here, in chapter 1 and verse 2. I want to just took, take a look at a couple of key verses here. Before Paul goes and directly talks about the air, he's been building a case for truth so that you know the truth. I love the fact that every now and then I try and trick you. I'll read a verse in, in the Bible that isn't in the Bible, trying to see if your wheels are turning. I will say something erroneous and claim it is the Word of God, or claim it is truth, to see if you're, if you're cogitating that something is wrong. I've seen this... Through the years, many times in my ministry, I'll say something uh, erroneous, and I will see the light go on in people's visages, their countenances. They don't know necessarily in the Word of God, chapter and verse, where to counter it, but they know something didn't sound right. Something was rotten in Denmark. Something didn't smell right to their knowledge concerning the Word of God. And so their countenance would, would, be, would belay the fact, would show the fact, that something wasn't right. Okay? So Paul is emphasizing Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ and Him alone, that He'd have the preeminence. So when you see someone taken away from the preeminence of Jesus Christ, you smell it, you know it, 
and something's wrong. Your discernment, you have, as Paul says in the Hebrews, those that are strong in the faith have exercised through reason of use their consciences to discern both good and evil. That takes some, it takes some work, it takes some practice, it takes some training to have your ability to discern good and evil as it comes forth from someone's mouth. So in, in the book of Colossians, he tells us in verse 13 of chapter 1 that Jesus Christ has delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of His dear Son. And it's in Him that we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins. It's He who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn, the first begatter of every creature. It's by Him that all things are created in heaven and earth and thrones and dominions. And it's, and it's by Him all things consist. And He's before all those things. And verse 18 says that in all things Jesus Christ should have the preeminence. That is the, that is the fundamental evangelical uh, unity of our faith that Jesus Christ it has the preeminence in all things. For it pleased the Father that in Him all fullness would dwell. Verse 20, having made peace through the blood of His cross, reconcile all things to Himself. You see, he's building there. Verse 27, To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among you, among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in, That's our hope of glory. It's Jesus Christ, not a member of the church of Quia, not because you know Pastor Warren Campbell that, that helped you, not, not a whit on the day of judgment. You've got to know Jesus Christ. And he's got to be in you, and that is our hope. And then in, in uh, chapter 2, we see in verse 3, in Jesus are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. That's a verse you should probably have underlined. In whom are hid, in Jesus Christ, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Verse 6, as you therefore receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him. As you receive Him in faith. And he's going to go down in verse 9. We won't get to that today. For in Him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead body. So we have spent, this is actually my 14th message in the book of Colossians. 14th message here, going through chapter 1 and the first part of chapter 2, emphasizing the preeminence of Jesus Christ in all things, so that when we get away from that preeminence, something should ring a bell with you, something doesn't sound right, something doesn't smell right, something just, you just know there's something and you need to, you need to check on it, it just isn't right. That way you're not carried about with every wind of doctrine, as Paul says, whereby men lie and wait to deceive. One of the things we need to get across today is there are men and women out there that would love to deceive you. They would love to make merchandise of you, and it happens in Christianity every, uh, every day. Something like that is going on. So he says in, in verse 8, Paul says, Beware lest any man spoil you. Now, we've got to get the, that's an old English word. We were talking to Dean on Wednesday about old English words and how they're, their usage is. This is an old English word. It's not spoil as in the, the uh, pancake batter was spoiled or the, you know, the, the, the uh, roast beef was spoiled. This is spoil, an old, you would remember as the, let's see, we, it's the blank of war. What is the blank of war? Uh, spoils of war. So you know that terminology. The spoils of war is the booty. It's the gold. It's the silver. It's the gals. Whatever you want. It's the, the riches of war. So Paul says in verse 8, Beware lest any man spoil you. Lead you away as booty. Lead you away as captive. As a spoil of war. It's a warning to take heed. Be on watch. Be in condition yellow for those of you that train with firearms. We must be in condition yellow because there are people that want to lead you and I away as booty, as a spoil of war. Spoil means to take captive or lead away as booty. Ancient and modern battle victories with long lines of wretched prisoners is an example that should be foremost in your mind, and they glory and gloat in the facts, especially in the ancient battles, and they would take those prisoners, if you recall, in ancient Rome, they would lead them through the gates there of Rome, and they would have the triumphal entry to the triumphal archway, and the, you know, the general, and he would have his booty, have his spoil, and here's all these poor people that are, you know, that are now slaves, and, and, the, and the general would pass out some gold and some trinkets to the 
to the uh, uh, the people there that were that would line the streets of Rome as they have this great parade and all this great booty. There used to be a man in the community here. He's passed away a few years ago now. He took it sort of as his mission to try and whatever my dad would do, he would try and do the opposite to lead people away unto himself. And so he had a mission. He felt like a passion to, and he and he relished in the fact that if if my dad would baptize someone that he could re-baptize them. And so he spent his efforts trying to undo in the community here what Dad had done in 30 years of ministry. He was always trying to undo. And, and he, when he could undo that, and he could lead someone to himself, that was a spoil of war for that individual. And you could see him relish, and you could see him gloat as he would talk to me, myself or my father. Then I got another one away from you, Pastor Campbell. And, and, and to him it was actually a spoil of war. And this is the way people are working with our minds. They would lead us as booty, as a, as, as a prey to their own egomania that has to be built by uh, having more and more people to give them validation. Now I mentioned about the, and that's just an illustration, this goes on in the church world, beloved, whether you recognize it or not. That's why Paul said in Galatians, don't be desirous of vain glory. Don't be desirous of that kind of vain glory. So I was giving you the image here where Paul says, men will lead you away as spoil. They'll lead you away as booty. And I talked about the fact that you see the image in, in wartime of all these individuals, you know, and they're, and they're all just decimated as, as they're being led away from one country into another. Uh, the Bible gives a picture of this. Hold your hand in Colossians 2. I want you just for a moment to see the wretchedness of this in Isaiah chapter 47. Isaiah chapter 47. And verses 1 to 3 of Isaiah 47. Now this is a judgment upon ba Babylon and Chaldea. God used Babylon and Chaldea to spank his people, the Israelites, but he wanted them to recognize that he was the one that put Chaldea and Babylon into the upper position to spank Jerusalem and the Israelites to get them back to God. And they wouldn't do it. They wouldn't acknowledge that it was God doing a work even in them as unbelievers, and so God's upset about it. So he says uh, in verse 1, Come down and sit in the dust, O virgin daughter of see, Babylon. Sit on the ground, there is no throne, O daughter of the Chaldeans, for thou shalt no more be called tender and delicate. In other words, they are tender, they have, they're, they're the winning, they were on the winning side, they've got all the money, they've got all the riches, but they would not acknowledge God in His role in their conquering of is, the Israelites. Verse 2, take the millstones and grind meal. This is what he's saying. This is, what, okay, you, you were once a delicate lady walking with all kinds of finery and goodness. This is what your life is going to be like now. You're going to be at the millstone and you're going to be grinding meal. Uncover thy locks. That means you're going to have the role of a servant. You're not going to have the nice veil over your head anymore. You're going to be uncovered in your locks, which in that day was not a good thing. Make bare the leg. Uncover the thigh, pass over the rivers. This is the, this is this is the, he's giving them the example. This is exactly what's going to happen to you when they lead you away as booty. They're going to strip your garments. See, the ladies' garments are going to be stripped from them. Maybe they'll be stripped from the from the waist down. There'll be partial nudity. Their thighs will be exposed. Their legs are going to now be exposed because that's what they did with slaves in those days. That's exactly. The imagery of what God's saying. If you don't recognize me, uncover the thigh, pass over the rivers. So you're going to be led through, you're going to be led out through these rivers half naked. Thy nakedness shall be uncovered, yea, thy shame shall be seen. I will take vengeance, and I will not meet thee as a man. For our Redeemer, notice because this is judgment from God, not judgment from man. As for our Redeemer, the Lord of hosts is his name, the Holy One of Israel. God is holy and He wanted to, this people to recognize that He had put them in positions of prominence and power. <laughs> For instance, if God uses a nation to spank the United States of America, whether it be the Chai Kongs or, or uh, Communist Russia or whoever it would be, God has, is raising that nation up and He expects that nation to recognize what it is that how they got into the position they got to, to be the head rather than the tail. And if they don't acknowledge God in that, God will uh, deal with them. So I wanted to give you that imagery of 
leading someone away as prize or booty. Okay? So now we'll come back to Colossians chapter 2. And let me give you two quotes here as we continue on. First one is from William Barclay in his commentary. He says, One thing clear is that the false teachers wish the Colossians to accept what can only be called additions to Christ. Additions to Christ. Yeah, you've got to have Christ, but you've also got to be da 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 the, the, uh, the reformers use the term sola Christi, Christ alone. So one thing is clear that the false teachers wish the Colossians to accept what can only be called additions to Christ. They were teaching that Jesus Christ himself is not sufficient. There are several cultic religions that teach that Jesus Christ is a good starting point, but you've got to do through your own works. He only started a good work for you in your life, but you've got to continue through your good works to attain salvation. But Jesus Christ is sufficient. They were teaching that Jesus Christ himself is not sufficient, that he was not unique, that he was among many manifestations of God, and that it was necessary to know and to serve other divine powers in addition to him. If you ever have someone tell you that uh, Jesus Christ was a good man, I, well, I think Jesus Christ was a, a great man. But, uh, you know, uh, so was uh, Prince Siddhartha, so was, you know, uh, so was uh, whoever, uh, Mohammed, you know, whoever they are like, but they, they say, oh, well, Weebly just was a good man. They are, that's an ignorant statement that's being made by them, and you can correct that, in that they, 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 they like the Jesus that went about, as the Bible says, doing good and healing all that were oppressed with the devil because God was with them. But they don't know that Jesus said, that said, Unless you believe that I am He, the Messiah, the Son of God, you'll die in your sins. So they don't know the Jesus that said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I've talked to you a lot about this in Colossians 1. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes into the Father but by me. Now, do you still believe He's a good man? He, he, he said there's no other way to get to the Father. See, And so you need to help educate them so that they don't have good feelings toward Christ unless they totally cast themselves on His mercy. Neither cast your, yourselves on the mercy of Christ and be broken by Him, or Jesus Himself said, I will grind you to powder. All right? And so, those are the choices. So you either got to love Him or you got to hate Him. Now, if that's, why, that's why we get to the book of Revelation. Doesn't the Revelator say, through the mouth of our Lord, I would rather have you cold or hot, but because you're lukewarm, I'll spew you out of my mouth. We'd rather have someone that, and there are people, don't you? They hate Jesus because they know He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And they want a whole bunch of other ways to get in. So that's pluralism that has crept into America, and it's an abomination. We have a real problem with pluralism in America. I don't want to address that. But they're adding to Jesus. Charles Erdman said, This much is beyond question. The heresy which threatened the Colossians was Jewish. Its advocates sought to bind upon Christian believers the Hebrew ceremonial with its rites, feasts, and fasts. And then in the verses, we won't look at it today, but we're going to talk about those rites, feasts, and fasts. It was also ascetic and taught the neglect or abuse of the body. You've got to, that, you've got to subject the body. You've got to lay on nails. You've got to lay on a cold cement floor to get closer to Jesus. How many of you know that that's his, in history? Monks did that. They'd lay on a cold cement floor that thought it may help them get closer to Jesus. And that, that doesn't help you get closer to Jesus. The, mor the mortification of the flesh, right. Furthermore, he says, it was mystical. We're going to see these in Col Colossians. Furthermore, it was mystical. It included the worship of imaginary angelic beings and embodied elements of oriental mysticism which exhibited the proud pretensions which characterized systems of occult science. Basically, in a nutshell, that they had deeper truths, deeper teachings, that if you wanted to really get deep, you had to go through them to get these. And that's, that's sort of like, you know, remember when the Maharishi came to America in uh, 1968 and through the Beals, you know? And that, if to really get deep, you had to do all this ethereal, mystical type of incantations and a lot of high platitudinous words, which really, when it boiled down to, meant very little. But it sounded spiritual on the surface. We'll look at that probably some more. So he says that, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. So we need to look at that. 
after the tradition of men, not after the rudiments, and after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. So let's talk about philosophy for a minute. Philosophy, or a philosopher, is a lover of wisdom. To, to love wisdom is a good thing. There's nothing wrong with that. But in this case, it was bloviating to ensnare those who were not grounded in the Word. platitudinous, high-sounding words to ensnare those that are not grounded in the Bible and in Jesus Christ. Quote-unquote, deeper truths. New revelation that nobody else has. I remember uh, a man, a number of years ago, we had a, uh, a man wanted us to see a, a, a video real, real, real bad here at the church. So, we, so, we, so I showed this, I guess I looked at it at my house first. I like to screen the videos. And this guy was had, had a new way of interpreting the Bible. And everything was what he called a double speak. And so he went through this process that the only way you can interpret the Bible properly is through the methodology that he had. And so I was able to just reject it offhand. Just immediately. No. Why? Because the Bible says that Scripture is of no private, private interpretation. Man. Not one man can come on the scene and say, I know how to do it now. And he had his, all, his whole methodology lined up, and he was going to teach the Christian world how to understand the Bible and how to interpret it. But the Bible, see, when, you, when you're grounded in the Word right away, the Bible is of no private interpretation. One man, if he comes on and says, I'm going to teach you how to interpret the Bible, huh? something's rotten in Denmark, something stinks. Yeah. Yeah. Deeper truths. I've got this revelation that nobody else has. Let me give you some examples of that. Then a couple come to the church here about seven years ago or so, and uh, Dad and I were talking to them, and of course, Dad was all excited, a new couple visiting the church, and they said, uh, uh, you know, I forget how we got into it, but they said, we're from the sevenfold ministry, the sevenfold ministry. Now, most churches talk about a fivefold ministry of the pastor, evangelists, prophets, teachers, and things like that. Uh, but they are from the sevenfold ministry, in other words, the deeper truth, and so... I re recognized right away these people are going to last more than, 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 than one week or two weeks. They didn't even last two weeks, so they were gone. They were actually lived here in Three Rivers, and they went somewhere else where they could have their deeper teaching, or they could articulate the sevenfold ministry. man came to visit us here at the, at the ranch a number of years ago, and he had a special revelation called the Father's Camp. He said that there's, the people are emphasizing Jesus and the Holy Spirit too much in Christianity, but the Father has given me a revelation that he needs to be uh, more taught on. So I'm in the Father's camp, and I want to get other people into the Father's camp. And so I thanked him for his honesty, and I said, you can stick around a couple days, but you need to be moving on, because I don't need your revelation of the Father's camp. There's a guy that came up about three years ago, four years ago from Hawaii. He flew all the way from Hawaii uh, to talk to me about special revelation that he had for the church at Kauia. And his name was Sonny. And Sonny came from the word son, the son of God. And he had this gal with him, and, and in the course of time he stayed with us a couple, three days. And they were uh, living in a tent uh, up on the, right there by the bamboo. And so it didn't take long to realize that Sonny and daughter were living together. So I was able to ask them to leave rather quickly, Sonny and daughter. And that was, so I, I asked him, what, what, you know, and I want to teach you something here. You know, what's, your, what's your name? He said, oh, Sonny. And, 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 the, and the lady with you, and I met them, and he hesitated. You know, uh, well, daughter. Okay, so daughter. Well, come on, what's, what's her real name? And he, he didn't want to give it to me because it was given by special revelation. She had a special revelation name. So he didn't want to give it to me. So anyway, they moved on. But these are people. These are people that would spoil the pastor and then in turn spoil you guys with philosophy and vain deceit. We had just recently a couple, a very nice couple, came this summer. And he was with us three or four days, and he was from the law, the law group, and everything was the law. And, Ed, and, 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 and he, he so parsed words, and so got caught up in the labyrinth of semantics, what my dad called the labyrinth of six semantics, that he couldn't even have a normal conversation with you because he was, he, he was so careful about everything he said. So Ed talked to him one Sunday, he was, there, he was here for a Sunday morning, and Ed came up to me afterwards, he said, I think this guy's a plant, because I asked him a simple question, where are you from? And he's, and he's struggling, we, we, we were saying, he said, you know, uh, you know what, what do you do for a living? And he, he was so bound that if he had, didn't say the right word, 
we, that, that, that he actually looked like he might be a plant, someone that was afraid to say what he's saying, because he was bound by the fact that he had been taught that, it, that all kinds of definitions were different than what he had learned. So if I said, let's go take out the trash, he's not sure if he can take out the trash because he doesn't know what trash really means in the, in the devil's dictionary. You know, because there's a dictionary called the, I can't think of, forget the man who wrote it. Dave Elmer might remember the man who wrote the Devil's Dictionary. It's off at the top of But anyway, these kind of people are coming and they would bring us in to that bondage. You see that? They would bring us into bondage so we can't even have normal conversation anymore because we might say something that is incorrect or is not historically whatever. When I say let's take out the trash, everybody knows we don't have to think twice about it. Now, if something sounds deep or profound, it may be at first blush, as I taught you. It may sound at first blush. Well, that sounds real deep. That sounds real profound as we, as we first hear it at first blush. But thank God for His Word by which we can test all philosophy, test the past Pastor Campbell today, test him by the Word of God to see whether it be true or just be vain deceit. So when the man came on, he was going to teach us how to learn the new way of learning the Bible through double speak, and he was the only one that had that revelation. I could easily throw it out because the Scripture is of no private interpretation or private revelation. So you see how, and then I can walk in victory. But there are men out there that would lead us astray. So here's here's the bottom line. Go with me. Hold your hand in Colossians. Go with me to Second Peter chapter two. Now, we've looked at this a couple times in our study in Colossians 1, but we're going to continue to get this solidified in our minds because the first fundamental law of teaching is... Repetition. Repetition. Correct. So we're going to do some repetition. Verse 19. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you who privily, on the sly, quietly shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. Remember, error is readily received. Truth, very slowly. Write that down in the flyleaf of your Bible. Error is readily received. Truth, very slowly. And here it is, verse 3. And through covetousness, through love of money, love of power, they shall with feigned words, false words, they sound platitudinous, they sound real spiritual, they sound real deeper truths, but with feigned words they'll make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. How many know someone that tried to make merchandise of you? Raise your hand. You've met someone in the past, they literally, man, they sought you out, they found you, and boy, they would just feel they were wanting to make merchandise of you. They were going to use you for another notch in their belt. Oh. Another notch on their gun or whatever. And so, this is why, this is the warning. See, this is the warning. In chapter 2 of Second Peter, here is a warning against false teachers. They come and they do it out of covetousness because they want to have another notch in their belt. This summer, guy called me up. He was the Messiah, <laughs> and so I, I, I told, I told him that illustration. I warned Luke. I, I, I had to get him to hear it. I invited Kevin over if he wanted to hear this guy. And it's ranting and raving because I hung up on him after a while. I gave him about twenty minutes, and then finally I said, "Well, that's enough. I've given you enough time." And so then he got, then he called back two or three times, yelling and screaming because Five I wouldn't times. accept him as the Messiah. Five times. Five times. Okay. <laughs> then we started getting worried. Oh boy. Oh, then I, oh boy. I'm going to have to change my number, which has been around for 50 years, our telephone number. Oh, I'm going to have to change it. But he's probably in a nut house by now. He was in a single wide trailer living with his mom, and uh, he was talking to me about the peru parousia, the presence. And, and anyway, I, but 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 what got him? What got him is he was pointing that he was the Messiah and that the presence that he had come back as the Messiah. And I said, and he said, and he said he'd been around for a while and he's, and he's still going to be around longer teaching amongst the people. And I said, but, the, but, but Paul said that this is just to be for a very short time. And I said, and then, and then he would go on. And I said, but, but, you're, but no, I, I can't agree with what you're saying because we agreed on several things at first. Paul said, well, the parousia will be for a very short time and then we'll be caught up together and shall we be forever with the Lord. And he stopped quoting Paul. Oh, Jesus. And he got mad. See? 
We're gonna get too wet. Because I have because that's being grounded and rooted in the word. Doesn't mean I can't get deceived somewhere along the line. But you understand that's how I fought him, was back with the word. He got so mad. It's like Paul said short time. What are you gonna do with Paul? Well, I don't believe Paul. Well that tells me it's all I don't think. Yeah, so so yeah, we'll get to that. Kevin and I are gonna have we had some we've had some real fun through the years with this. I had a guy from uh, a few years ago, but I'm just telling you, this is what happens. I had a guy from uh, uh, Nevada, and he called me, and he wanted to teach. He wanted to teach at the church of Kauai. He gave me a cassette tape of his to listen to. And he, and he, and he was one of those that parsed definitions again. It was all about definitions, definitions. And so he, his definition was religion. He couldn't stand Kevin's story. Remember this? His, his definition of religion was realized gin. Religion. Religion. R e l i g i o n. Religion is realized. R e a l realized gin. See, religion is re realized gin. See, then he, then he, this is true. I still got this cassette tape. I got to get it on DVD or CD so I don't lose. It. This is precious stuff. Well, you can't make this up. <laughs> you can't make it up. Somebody did. That's what it was. I can't make this stuff up. So you know, I played it on a Sunday, didn't I? I played the cassette through the, through the microphone. Yeah. So religion is realized gin. Gin is an intoxicating beverage. Okay? Now this is the definition of religion. He wants to teach this to the church of Kuya. Gin is an intoxicating beverage and is also a trap. The old word in, the, in King James for trap is gin. A bird, a bird is caught in the gin. A bird is caught in the trap. So the people are they're drunk on this intoxicating beverage they're trapped by the gin, and what is it they're trapped in? Realize is lies upon lies. Oh. Sounds like the something. people in the denominations are trapped in lies upon lies through the gin of their intoxicating beverage, and they need to know the proper definition. And so religion is realized gin, lies upon lies. And this man called me a couple of times. This is going, this is going back now 10 years ago or so. And anyway, I had to, you know, finally, I just had to cut him off. At the knees. Remember, a number of years ago, a man came to, and he was visiting my dad in the front yard, and, and he was coming up with this stuff. This, but I'm talking about this is how you control people by changing definitions, by having to redefine things and stuff like that. And this is how people are controlled. And he began to tell dad about Korea, and he and he had all, and he and, he's, and the Lord's just showing me right now Korea, and he had a definition of Korea. He says ka. And he has ka in the Hebrew, and he was going to this kawia ka. And that's no, 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 no. Kawia ka for cockroach. Kawia cockroach. <laughs> and my dad just, you know, kawia for. But the guy was serious, man. They're not playing games when they're trying to lead you away as spoil and booty. Man, they're serious. And he had all this spiritual definition for kawia. And dad says no, ka cockroach. <laughs> now, how do we deal with this? How do you handle this sort of thing scripturally? Keep your, keep your hand in Colossians. Let me, I'll tell the story. Go, go with me to Galatians, and I'll tell the story of, of Kevin and I that had an experience here. That was pretty precious. <laughs> Galatians chapter 2. So in the midst of this, one day Kevin and I are up at the research center, and this guy's putting in the satellite dish and working on the satellite dish. And Kevin, and I, Kevin was working on a, a screenplay for a movie called uh, Re Religiosity that he still made one day right, produce. And so we were talking about these kind of guys that come on the scene. And we were, we were laughing about this guy, you know, realized religion is realized gin, and we were going on and on, and guys that Kevin had met that had all this deeper tr truth and teaching in Three Rivers and so forth, and he was going on. And so then I told him, and I said, yeah, Kevin, and when I was a kid, I'm, 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 kill I'm, just, I'm just hitting myself because I used to have this card, and I lost it and threw it away. And this guy's calling card was Reverend David Solomon Stone Slinger Diarian. Reverend David <laughs> Solomon Stone Slinger Diarian. And then when Kevin heard this, he just about died. And on the bottom of the card was prophet and sex therapist. <laughs> <laughs> you can't get any better than that. The guy can never make that out in a million years. And I lost his card, and I'm so mad. So Reverend David Solomon Stone Slinger D'Arian was also a prophet and a sex therapist. And I had his card. And then and, and so Kevin and I were having this, we're just going berserk, having and laughing our head. And this guy that's installing the satellite, he says, oh, you guys turn to prophets. He says, I, I work for a prophet. And he gave us his card. And he's like, he says, here's the prophet's card right here. <laughs> oh, man, we can't wait for losing. They're everywhere. 
But now, if you haven't run across them, I'll tell you one reason why. And this is not a condemnatory thing at all. It's not being condemnatory. It's not being, it's not judgmental. But one of the reasons why we run across them is because we got a lot of truth here. And the devil wants to rob and destroy the truth that is resonant here. Amen. It's not unique to the church at Korea in that we know we've got a, a whole, I teach on that whole historical position. I'm not teaching anything that I'm not standing on the shoulders of great men that have gone on before. You guys know that. I'm not bringing you any new revelation here or anything like that. But because the Spirit of God is using us for a particular method, therefore we are under more attack by kooks and nuts. I'll give you another example of that. When we had uh, John Trockman from the Militia of Montana come to uh, our conferences back around circa 1999, 98, 2000, and there he came two or three times. When he would come, there would be some nuts that would come with him. And I remember we had Vince was we had uh, established some security because there were some really fruitcakes, and I didn't want them because at that time when when John Trockman would come, the reporters would come because Militia of Montana was a big thing. In 99, 2000, because remember he was speaking on Phil Donahue, Congress. all the universities were having a debate about militias and all that kind of stuff. But the point is, the Second Amendment is so important, beloved. It is so powerful that kooks hang around the periphery, kooks hang on the fringe of that, because if we lose that, man, we are in slavery. We'll be enslaved. Right. See? So because it is so important, so powerful, Kooks would follow him wherever he went to try to discredit. So when the media is there, here's these kooks. Ah, I believe in the Second Amendment as they're frothing at the mouth or whatever. And I believe in the Second Amendment. Here, meet my ten wives or whatever. <laughs> uh, and so then that's all they have to do. That's all the media can just go. You know, that's all they're looking for. But the point is, where truth is, there's a lot of this kind of stuff going on, and we have to be aware. So in Galatians chapter two, how do we deal with these kind of people? Well, here's how Paul dealt with it. Galatians chapter 2, verse 1. Then 14 years after I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also, and I went up by revelation. Now this is for the canonization of Scripture. I have no problem with Paul having revelation. Neither does the rest of the church world. And I went up by revelation and communicated unto them the gospel which I preach unto the Gentiles, but privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run in vain. But neither Titus who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to to be circumcised. So he, Paul was meeting with Titus and said, oh, Titus is a Greek? Yeah, well, let's, check, let's take a look here and see if it, he's missing some skin. And verse 4, And that because false brethren, unawares, brought in, we didn't know who they were, but they came in, and they came in privately, privately, covertly, to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus that they might bring us into bondage. There are literally people that will come into a Christian assembly to spy out the liberty that we have. It's known as uh, the, uh, the something of conscience. Liberty of conscience, doctor. That we have liberty in Christ Jesus. So that for us, if it's not a faith, it's sin. If we can't do it in, in faith, quorum deo, before the face of God, then we don't do it. But if we can do it in quorum deo, before the face of God, then we do it. And we have liberty. So you guys have a lot of liberty here, as you know. All right, so they came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. Now, here's what Paul did to these guys. To whom we gave place by subjection. No, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. Sometimes I just tell people, get lost. No, and I do it tonight. No, you need to go. Oh, pastor, you're not patient and loving with them. Paul said, I can give these guys an hour. I've been actually, I'm more patient than the Apostle Paul. So a lot of these guys got two or three days with me or a month. <laughs> That's just a joke, of course. But, but it's true. Sometimes I'll give them two or three days or a week I'm, because I'm trying to reach them. But Paul had determined these guys were not going to be reached. They were hardened. They were diabolical in what they were trying to do covertly and what they were trying to supplant. He says, I didn't give place space for an hour. That's it. Get, up, get, up, get out. Don't have any time for you. So that's how you handle it. Don't give them space. Don't, inter don't try to be a Christian. Be, be real nice and sit there and let this guy bloviate for two or three hours. Now, you might on occasion do that. You might on occasion if you feel led. But you, you know, this guy's boy, this guy's messed up, this poor young kid. You know, maybe he's had one too many LSD trips or something. You're trying to reach him. There's a place for that. 
But if you know a guy is very seasoned, you may not. Yes, we go. There's a seed that's been planted, and as we read earlier, that seed won't return void. God will go and accomplish Mary. Goes, yeah, exactly what God said he could believe or ordains it to accomplish. But sometimes we just have to let people know, now, take that with you and don't bring it around here. Because they're looking at, and what would, what would they do if we allow, here's another story from history of dad. He allowed a guy like that to come around once. And uh, he was he was in called the, the local church. You better remember the member of the cult, the local church. But down by Say, well, you'll see him down there. Anyway, so this was when I was about 15 or so. This guy came from the local church, and he was a nice young man. And, but after he'd been here about six months or so, next thing you know, two or three of the young people are caught up in this thing. It comes to, it comes from the Orient's Oriental stuff from uh, Watchman Nee's brother Witness Lee. If any of you guys are up on the cold stuff, but anyway, so we actually learned. Dad learned a lesson there of being a little bit too tolerant with this kind of nonsense that comes around. That's why we have because there's people at different walks of life. I dare say right here in our congregation today, there's people who've been saved 30 years. They should be quite solid. There's people 10 years been a Christian. There might be someone here a year or less. And so sometimes they're not rooted and grounded in the faith, and these types of things can lead them away and bring them into bondage. So we, that's why we have to be careful. And pastors have a special role there in trying to nip that kind of stuff in the bud. All right, so we're back in Colossians, verse 8. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men. Does anyone remember what I taught you about tradition? Somebody should be out. I've done it a number of times. When you think of tradition, what should we think? I'm going to take a stab at it. That tradition can be... Good or bad. What can tradition be? Anybody? Good or bad. Don't throw it out uh, prima facie just because it's tradition. It can be good or bad. Go to, open your Bibles to 2 Thessalonians. Go forward about six pages. Colossians... Yeah, 1st, 2nd Thessalonians. 2nd Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 15. As Paul himself said, Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you have been taught, whether by word or epistle. Some traditions are good. I just don't throw it out just because it's tradition. Now, if it's a bad, tra if it's a bad tradition, we might want to throw it out. But what I'm saying is there are traditions of men that are, that are bad, but there are some traditions that are very good traditions. For example... There's a tradition. It's a tradition of man. But I'm not prepared to throw it out because I think it's a good tradition. If, uh, if There's Mary Jo. If Mary Jo and I are approaching a door, I will open the door for Mary Jo to let her go through. Or I'll hold the door open, right? For Mary Jo, I'll open it and say, oh, go ahead, Mary Jo. But that's a tradition. Men honor women. You open the door for a lady. That's just a tradition. There's nothing holy or <laughs> sacrosanct about that. But it's a good tradition to appreciate women. So, young boys, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let the girls go first, right? We teach our, let the girls go. That is a tradition. It's a good tradition. I want to hold on to it. Right? But there are some bad traditions we can let those go. You understand. I just want, when you hear the word tradition, it doesn't necessarily mean evil or bad. You have to say, okay, what tradition? And examine it. That's, that's what I'm trying to teach her. What examine? But the Jews put great stock in tradition. They, their tradition was such that they equated their tradition with the very word of God. And that's when Jesus came on the scene. He says, you do err by your traditions because you're making your oral traditions equal yeah. Yeah. with the word of God. And there are churches today that make tradition equal with the word of God and it's not meant to be that way. Warren Luke mentioned Fiddler on the Roof. Remember the opening scene there is tradition, tradition. And the whole movie's about all his traditions being unraveled and, you know, unwinding before his very eyes. But he was so strong. And we have tradition. And those traditions were going by the wayside. So even good traditions are not to be equated with the Word of God. We have good traditions, but we don't necessarily equate them on par with the Word of God. So he says, be careful of these things. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. After the tradition of men. It's men that do that sort of thing. After the rudiments of the world. What are the rudiments of the world? Preparatory rites and observances before the coming of Jesus Christ. Paul calls them, the author of Hebrews says, the carnal ordinances, fleshy ordinances that 
people would come in and still make us be bound to certain ordinances of the flesh rather than recognizing the substance of Jesus Christ. I give an example, uh, the Feast of Booths or the Feast of Tabernacles, where in the Old Testament time they literally built up a, a little, uh, like a lean-to, and they lived in that for a week. And there are people that want us to literally take time out of our schedule and believe that we ought to, out of obedience to Christ, live in a booth, a temporary uh, lean-to, for a week. And, uh, you know, that just, I'm not, I don't have to set aside a week of my life to, to do that. Preparatory rites and observances before the coming of Jesus. So that, that these things, but you see, the, the problem is people get caught up in that. And people feel extra spiritual because of it. Because we are a free church here and rejected the 501c3, I'm looking right at the camera, does not make us more spiritual than anyone else. Okay? We're just doing our best to exercise and discern the Word of God and rightly divide it. It doesn't make us any more spiritual than anyone else. Because we hold the, the doctrine of the preeminence of Jesus Christ in all things, especially in His church. So, rights, the rudiments of the world, trying to get us back in, in observing. He's going to talk about that. Observing moons and Sabbaths. Oh, it's a half moon, we better do this. It's a quarter moon, we better do that. Let's just get away from all that kind of stuff, because now you have the substance, which is Jesus Christ. Christ is the substance, as we have seen in our study. And we will see in verse 17. Look at verse 17 across the page there probably for you. He talks about we meet, drink, holy days. Not anybody judge you in these things. And then he says in verse 17, which are a shadow of things to come. You see that? The, the, the feasts and the sacrifices in the Old Testament ritual and temple were, were shadows of the things to come. And that that thing to come, they all pointed to Jesus Christ. Because the body or the substance is Christ. Now, why would people want to choose vain deceit and traditions and philosophies and things like that? Vain deceit, as Paul is talking about here in uh, verse 8, uh, the worst man's of philosophy and vain deceit is something that's vain is empty. It, it doesn't profit anything. It's just empty. It, they're not going to help me in any way. Uh, Jimmy Swire commentary, he wrote this, Religion is designed to appeal to men in various different ways. It appeals to their prejudice, their bias, greed, or pride. Consequently, it appeals to the flesh. Something about some of these observances that appeal to our flesh. We like it because it makes us feel more superior. Consequently, it appeals to the flesh in these respects. It has a drawing power because it is addressing something that individuals want or think they want. The power of the appeal to our flesh. I used to have a picture, I've lost it, and now a photograph. There was a guy in Los Angeles, California, 123 Lake Street in Los Angeles, California, and he got a revelation, this would be circa 1960, 19, late 50s, his name was O.L. Ja o. L. Jaggers. I visited his church, had a golden altar in front of it, and if you wanted to pray, you had to pray towards the golden altar. Well, it had a following because there's something that appeals to our flesh, it's something we can do. We can do a, a work of the flesh, pray towards this golden altar. And so he had a big this he had a big thing that he called the Melchizedekian communion. And he had a picture, this big picture, big old black and white, and they blew it up and you could get it by, you know, for a donation. I think God got it somehow way, way back. And it was the four and twenty elders serving this special Melchizedekian communion. And so boy the picture, and you could see you know, those guys, boy, to be be one of the four and twenty elders to serve communion for the worldwide celebration. Boy, that's it. See, that appeals to the flesh. But I'm one of the I'm one of the twenty-four elders. There isn't any other 24 elders in the entire globe except us 24. We're it. It appeals. We're special. We're unique. Our we've done something to make us. That's an appeal. That's how, the, that's how these cults are built. It appeals to their prejudice, bias, greed, or pride. Consequently, it appeals to the flesh in these respects. It has a drawing power because it is addressing something that individuals want or think they want. As I've often said here, when, our, when the ministers come around at conference time, and we sit around and we talk, we're all on the same level, just brothers in Christ. Nobody's trying to lord it over the other one, try and teach the other one in a superior way or a superior venue. We just fellowship. But there are men that will come, and if they're not on the starring role, they can't fellowship. Just like you and I fellowship around the table today at lunchtime. They have to be separate because they're inside. They're drawing men to themselves to lead us away. As booty. So that's why I appreciate the pastors and ministers that come for the conference. 
because they're not trying to lead me away as booty. We just sit around and fellowship and enjoy the Word of God together. So in closing, Paul says here, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Whatever does not rest on biblical truth, that salvation only comes through Jesus Christ and His work on the cross is false, empty, and vain. If I told you going to a free church puts you in better standing with God, you were to reject that. Say, no, Pastor. No, 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 Pastor. You're getting off there. You can't get any closer to God than the acceptance of faith in Jesus Christ and His work on the cross. Everything else would be false empty in vain. We preach, as Paul said, we preach Jesus Christ and Him crucified to you today. Father, we thank You for Your Word. Lord, I thank You that You've led us through many, as, as Amazing Grace says, through many toils and tribulations and snares we've come. I pray, Lord, that You would continue to preserve us from philosophy and vain deceit and traditions of men and rudiments of the world. Lord, we do not want to be led away as spoil or prey to some demented, twisted mind, Lord. But we want to embrace you, Jesus, so that we could say with uh, Andre Crouch, to God be the glory. In all things, Lord, may you have the preeminence, Jesus, and may you have the glory in all things. And if we should gain any praise, we give it back to Calvary. Touch the hearts of those that have heard today. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.